Hey YouTube, it's Moon. I just wanted to do a quick little intro at the top of this video because this is a little different format from what I normally post on here. This is actually a stream VOD and I wanted to edit it down because it has been a highly, highly requested video from my community. They didn't want it to expire off of Twitch. They wanted to make sure that it made its way to YouTube so that people could come to it later uh, because people found it to be very, very helpful. So what this was was a more TED Talk style, maybe podcast style stream. And hopefully this could become something that I do on the regular on my Twitch channel with a series that I'm calling Galaxy Brain which are just gonna be more educational streams where we, you know, sit down and have a real talk, tone down the chaos for a little bit. The topic of this first stream was creative development for artists of all skill levels, but I wanted to clarify that it doesn't just apply to artists. This really could be helpful information for anybody in any kind of creative endeavor, any passion, hobby, any skill that they're trying to develop. I may be talking from an artist's perspective, but I think you can get that same value out of it no matter what you are trying to get better at. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is the fact that this is very geared towards those of us who have ADHD, autism. I have a lot of neurodivergent folk in my community and I wanted to tailor this presentation to them because a lot of times the tips that we receive from you know, the internet at large don't necessarily apply to us. Sometimes they'll have the opposite effect. And so I wanted to share what works for me. Now this stream itself was initially sponsored by Skillshare uh, because this VOD is not sponsored by Skillshare. I did cut out those sponsored segments, really just leaving the meat of the presentation. If you want a list of the classes that I did recommend to my community, those are available down in the description. Like I said, I do want to turn this into a series potentially. So if you've got ideas for future Galaxy Brain streams, I'd love to hear them in the comments. And that's all I had to say. So let's jump right into the presentation. Today's topic right off the bat is how to develop yourself creatively. But I wanted to put a special kind of focus on if you are neurodivergent, if you have ADHD, if you're autistic, if you have, you know, any other neurodivergent traits that have maybe created some hurdles for you when it comes to like trying to become better at art. So I'm going to be talking about um, ways to kind of like identify what those roadblocks are and how they might affect you differently if you are. Because I know, again, we have a lot of ADHD uh, folks, a lot of autistic folks in my community. Uh, and so I wanted to give a presentation that is catered to my community specifically. And I think we all know why we're here. <laughs> it's because we flock together, right? Like I myself being ADHD, being autistic, um, those are things that I have been through. And I know a lot of a lot of the feedback I get on my streams is like, hey, you say things that make me realize stuff about myself. <laughs> On HD represent. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We flock to each other. Exactly. <laughs> we feel more comfortable with each other. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to be able to speak from that perspective today. And and maybe you guys will especially I don't know, for me, a lot of the, like a lot of times when there's like tips, tips to get started in this, sometimes they don't work for me. And it's because of my ADHD getting in the way. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to merge those two things together today, <laughs> which I want to just open with. What are my qualifications? Why should you listen to me? <laughs> right? We'll talk about uh, my history with art uh, and. Career and education, uh, you know, what has been my path, because I think I get this question a lot in chat, and that is like. Did you go to art school? How did you learn art? How do I start learning art? Um, you know, how long have you been drawing? That kind of thing. Um, and it's a weird question to answer sometimes because it is kind of a like complicated question, right? Because you're like, when did you really start drawing? I mean, like pre-kindergarten, right? I think we all did. I think all of us drew when we were kids, right? It's just a question of how many of us kept doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, how long have you been drawing? My whole life, obviously. Because um, you're a moon bitch, only qualification needed. Ah, you're too sweet. <laughs> no, I, I, I do want to, you know, at least establish, you know, like 
what, how did I educate myself? Uh, if I'm going to sit here and give you tips on how to educate yourself, I want you to see what my path was too. Um, but yeah, so like, obviously I've been drawing since I was a kid. I was always really drawn to like art, creative stuff. Even though I never was like a big like comics reader, I still did a lot of like buying up the random comic here and there just because I thought it looked pretty. <laughs> Even though I wasn't following the story or knew anything about the lore, I was simply looking at the art and going like, wow, that's so cool. And like, I just found myself really like studying and absorbing anything that had pretty visuals on it. Even just watching cartoons as a kid, I just remember being like fascinated by like, you know, info or like like animation and stuff <gasps> hi honey welcome it if you guys if you guys want more art education and you're not following honey goblin you're seriously missing out please please go follow honey honey is like honey does these art 101 streams and they're like chef's kiss so if if you want the perfect follow-up to this stream you're gonna go to honey's art 101 streams <laughs> i also had the advantage of having a mom who was very creative herself. Um, she has always been in, you know, various creative endeavors, but I've talked about this on stream, how like my mom actually kept a sketchbook when I was a kid that like she would, um, she would actually like draw on one page and then hand it to me and have me draw on the other. So like I was encouraged from a very young age. Uh, and you know, that that was lucky because I think, you know, some people talk about their parents being like, oh, oh, there's my mom in chat. Can we get some love for McChilly? That's Mama Moon right there. That's Mama Moon. But yeah, so I, I I also had a lot of creative stuff in my family where, uh, you know, my uncle was an artist. Uh, he he is actually an art teacher. Uh, so he's an art educator. Uh, my my great grandma was a, a painter. She loved doing painting as a hobby. So like I always had kind of that creative streak in my family. Uh, and so that was something, hi son, welcome in. That was definitely something where like, I, I found a lot of uh, rewarding, you know, like I, it was rewarded, right? So, so I never found, I never had that moment of like, oh, don't go into art, don't go into art. You'll be a starving artist. Like my, my family was very, very, cool about that so i was lucky in that way um and so what i believe it was one of my birthdays i want to say like eighth grade was it eighth grade or, or seven no it was earlier than that was 2006 2006 i think is when i started making digital art um that's when i got my first my wacom tablet and i started doing digital art even though i'd been doing like sketch I was always like the artsy one in school, you know, like I was the art kid. <laughs> I was the art kid. But yeah, I had my my little bamboo, my Wacom bamboo tablet. That was my first tablet I got. And that that um, that kicked off uh, a lifetime of like, I mean, that's just that's how I got here. Right. Like that was that was that was a canon event. <laughs> <laughs> the little square tablet yeah dang it save the gifts of the sun that's so sweet <laughs> but yeah so that was that was like my my first delving into digital art and at the time i mean that was quite new right like so we're talking 2006 i started getting involved in online art communities uh and that that right there that's what i think took it from like art being like something i kind of like doing to like this is all I can think about. Like it became my, like my hyper fixation, right? Like that became my, my ADHD autistic hyper fixation was art. I was just nonstop drawing like the sheer amount of work that I put out during the like middle school and high school era of my life was actually like wild. <laughs> and, and, you can see like 2007 here. That's like one of my first digital art pieces that I've got up on this. <laughs> oh, what's this new ex obsession? Exactly. <laughs> you got that because I wanted you to be the best you could be. You've always had so much talent. Oh, <laughs> mom. You're so sweet. What the heck? No, it was it was like uh, it was interesting to me. And I think this is something that, again, the the. I think a lot of us will share in this chat is sometimes when something is new and exciting that will trigger your hyperfixation your drive 
your passion for creating is not just like the end result, but learning about how to do it. Right. Yeah. So so like digital art being something new and something I'd never seen before. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Jaunty. Thank you for the biddies. Uh, the dopamine hit for knowledge. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, it's like satiating that cur curiosity like that, I think, was the biggest drive was like I wanted to learn not just how to how to get better at art, but I wanted to learn how to like try new techniques that I'd never tried before. Um, you can literally see in the <laughs> in this 2007 piece, the hair is literally one of those deviant art hairbrush stamps that everybody had. Do you guys remember those? <laughs> it was like a, a a brush, and it's literally just like stamp on hair. <laughs> Same with the lightning. The lightning, absolutely, in that old one is just Welcome a to stamp. Is <laughs> underscore art? Yep, I think we've all been there. <laughs> But it's funny because like we can sit there and make fun of that, but at the same time, learning how to use them well is still relevant because in the Clips, Clip Studio store, I still use a ton of that kind of stuff, but I know how to incorporate it better now. I've learned how to like use it right. <laughs> Hyper-realistic brushes that don't match the style, my old bane. Yeah, <laughs> I, I definitely was really like drawn to just like learning all this new technology, right? Learning to draw with a tablet. It was something that I wasn't being educated on in school. So when people ask like, were you self-taught? Even though I went to art college, I still say yes to that question. And the reason why is because the bulk of my education, while I was learning a lot of the basics in my art classes in high school and stuff, a lot of the bulk of my digital art specific education was from like DeviantArt and online tutorials and watching, you know, videos and seeing stuff, uh, you know, all over the internet. It was a lot of like self-guided um, information, a lot of self-guided learning because I went to a really small school, like a very small welcome school. Welcome to the moon base, a sunset. Yeah, thank camps. you for the follow. Welcome in. I went to a really small school. I think my graduating class was like 42 people. I grew up in like a little middle of nowhere in the Midwest. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of resources uh, for for like this kind of thing. Right. Like this is this is so unique and new that there wasn't like programs in 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 our like high school for like learning digital art. <laughs> that was, you know, it was something that I got special like guidance on and was allowed to do special projects in from my teacher because I showed such an interest in it. But there wasn't like a program like, hey, hey, everybody, here's Photoshop and we're going to learn about it. Like, no, that was all like me learning it on my own. Uh, and so I had to rely on a lot of like online resources and stuff. And and even once I got to college, even my college professor, he was kind of like an old for, for illustration. I mean, he was kind of like an old uh, cartoons style thing. Like he had a lot of traditional knowledge. He did not have a ton of knowledge in digital. He was trying his best. But sometimes there's times where you would end up <laughs> teaching the, the teacher something that they didn't know because they just didn't. It was not something that had been around for a very long time. Uh, and so uh, I, I still say I'm kind of self-taught, like that sort of like self-guided learning that like that self um motivation uh is huge right because even though i went to art college right <laughs> even when i went to art college there were some classes i had where the professors would take the first two weeks of the course and just tell us to take an online an online course <laughs> And then they would guide the projects that came after it, but they didn't actually do the teaching. They'd send us to a place like Skillshare. They'd send us to Skillshare and be like, hey, take the class. Like that happened. I had two classes in college where that actually happened, where they did not. The first two weeks, they just told us to take online class and then they did the the learning afterwards. Um, <laughs> like I was like, OK, why am I paying you if I had known that I would have just taken a Skillshare course, <laughs> you know, like, um, but that was only a couple of them. I'm not saying like all art college is not worth it. It's just, you know, like there's the, what I'm saying is that 
there are some basic features of all art education that it doesn't matter whether you're going to be in higher education or in self-learning, you're going to be learning those same basic foundations. Education is whole seem to fail me. Well, you know, that's that's where you can be your own best teacher, right? Is by going, finding what you are passionate about, what you want to learn about, and then like pursuing that, right? Because that's, we live in an age of endless uh, online, like knowledge. Like we are, we are in, like a digital library of of like potential learning that is not something that's ever been available throughout history forever knowledge literally <laughs> cat videos no we're gonna learn today we're not gonna sit and watch tiktoks all day we're gonna go on skillshare and we're gonna learn things <laughs> uh but yeah i i i poked through here and found some stuff and i i, I wanted to show off a couple things um so like the biggest thing that you learn when you go to art college as i did um which i will say i actually went to college for graphic design uh but i actually took kind of this weird in-between course that is not offered it was only offered for like one year this one <laughs> i don't i don't know how to explain it but essentially i got like grandfathered into a program that they let me complete even though they were like hey we're reorganizing this but essentially it let me get the best of both worlds of graphic design and fine art education so i kind of got to learn both the commercial side of what they teach in college uh the more technical side i got to take a lot of my graphic design courses but i also took a lot of you know like drawing i took like the whole the whole course of of drawing courses welcome to the moon base Pay the moon welcome on matcha. in thank you for the follow uh so i got that fine art education so i know what they taught in art college this is essentially leading me to my first question which is like is formal art education a necessity and i think that there's it's a complicated answer because one i graduated in 2010 the industry has changed since then. So I can't tell you whether yes or no, you should go to art college. I simply can't. What I can tell you is that you can learn the things that you learn in art college on your own. So if, if it appear from a pure knowledge perspective, you can learn those same things with online learning. Certain jobs are going to require an actual degree. So if you are looking to apply somewhere and they have like minimum requirements for a degree, you might need that. However, Let's say you're doing a little bit more hitting the pavement style job searching, looking for opportunities through maybe Twitter. If you get really into the industry, the Twitter of the industry that you're trying to get into, you might be able to find opportunities just by having a really, really good portfolio. It may not it may not be a matter of having a, a specific degree more so than just being able to prove yourself. Um, so <laughs> I'll just do doodle and nothing wrong with that either. <laughs> Again, that's just if you're looking at, you know, career, a career in art, right? Like if you're looking at a, a career in art, there are some career paths that will require a degree and some that you may not need it. And sometimes it just is a matter of being able to market yourself correctly. Um, but regardless what you could get started on, um, is the foundations and that's going to apply to everyone and if you want to go okay i want to get i want to learn what they're learning in college i want to learn that i found courses that i'm like this is exactly it this one right here i took probably like two whole semesters of learning what hardy fowler has taught in an hour <laughs> i saw this and i immediately thought of projects that i did in college literally like like tell me that doesn't look like this. Here's actual college uh, uh, studies I had to do in my drawing courses. This was ink. <laughs> hey, hey, art college enjoyers or participants. Do you guys remember these old this old song and dance? Yep. Literally, this was like most of my drawing classes were just doing life studies. When, you know, later we got into like anatomy. But again, this was like find a real person and draw. I think that's actually Bread's nose, if I remember right. <laughs> that's Breadman's nose. This is, I think I was studying Barbara Streisand. Uh, 
But yeah, like... <laughs> Red nose, yeah. <laughs> like, these are all... These are the kind of basic studies that you need to do. And I know it's not exciting. Um, but find ways to gamify it. You know, find ways to, like... To either set, set like, a deadline for yourself. Like, I'm going to do this by this. And I think... I'll get into this more in a little bit, but like find ways to motivate yourself with curiosity rather than demand, right? That's where my nose went. Yeah, I, I drew it and I, I stole it. <laughs> so I think the next question that I wanted to cover is art style. I think I, I get... I see a lot of people struggle with this and I struggled with it for a long time is like, how do you choose an art style? How do you develop an art style? Is an art style like necessary? Do you have to have one? Um, mine's always changing. Like, I feel like I can never Welcome nail that down. Movies. I can never just pick one. Two. Thanks for the follow. Welcome in. Um, and I think the best way to start with that, well, first of all, whether it's, I don't know, whether it's important or not. Self-care protocol initiated. Please stretch. Oh, I'll stretch. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, that was a good one. <laughs> so one of the most important things I think you can do is ask yourself, what is the art that I enjoy the most? Um, because finding influences I think is like your number one thing, right? Your styles uh, will change as your taste and skills. Exactly. Exactly. Like no, no artist has ever just stuck to one art style their entire life. They found one maybe, and then they stuck to it, but they did not, they had to go through a lot of experimentation to get to that point. You don't just pop out instantly going, yep, this is how I'm going to draw forever now because we would never grow if that was the case. Right. So like, the best thing you can do is, yeah, it never ends. It never ends. Style's an accumulation of things in life. Yes. Yes, exactly. Like, for me, I think one of my, uh, I'm going to actually, there's so many, <laughs> so many creatives in my chat are going to be like, yep. You know, my biggest influence was back in my DeviantArt days, Loish. <laughs> I think every digital artist looked at Loish's art at some point and was like, "Ah, oh, how do I do that? L-O-I-S-H. <laughs> yeah, Loish, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Loish, Loish is still at it. Yeah, Lo Loish, I think. Loish inspired such a huge generation of artists. I love looking at character designs when a comic starts versus when it ends. Yes, I think that's that's a great point is like even even like established pieces of media will have art style changes. You just will. Half the chat is Googling Lois right now and the other half is like, yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, like. Yeah, yeah, she designed Alloy from Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah, if you don't know the name, you've probably seen the art at some point. If you are in, in any, in, involved in the art community in any capacity. Extremely iconic. Yeah, you probably have seen that art style. Uh, I think uh, really like showed people like what, what could be done in, the, in terms of stylization in the digital art space. Um, yeah, that was, that was like a huge influence. And I remember like having moments... Moments where I was trying to make art, I can go back and look through my my art from from my middle school, high school days, and I can see this piece had a Loish influence. I definitely was like trying to get that style. But then on the other hand, I was also into a bunch of weeb stuff, right? And I was trying to do anime style art, and I was trying to do comic style art, and I was trying to do realism, and I was trying, you know, like I was learning a little bit of everything. Is that anime? Um, actually, I'm exploring my cartoonish realism style right now. So, <laughs> also, whether you think you have an art style or not, you do. You just don't see it when you look at it. Outsiders will see an art style in your art, even when you're trying different, totally different stuff. But you can learn so much from just studying art. You like, don't worry about the genre. Just s collect art that you like, and eventually, you're gonna start to see the through lines. You're gonna start to see what it is that you like and you might pick up 
and kind of like Frankenstein together pieces from those different influences. You might you might find you really like doing line art, um, but you also like painterly style. So in my instance, like I have kind of two styles where I kind of have my toony style art and then I have my painterly style and they're kind of like two different looks I do, but the same base anatomy and color choices and lighting pulls them together and keeps them looking like me. They look they look like my art, like the way that my VTuber looks is totally different from a lot of the paintings I've been doing lately. Um, and that's OK. Like, it's fine to have multiple styles. In fact, having that kind of jack of all trades style means that you've got adaptability and you're going to be able to, let's say you're trying to get a career in the arts. Uh, if you're trying to apply to a few different jobs, there might be ways that you can tailor your portfolio by cherry picking pieces that maybe match that project. Um, but you'll be able to apply to a lot of different projects because you're going to have examples, right? Multi-style artists are so powerful. Yeah, like being able to be like an artistic chameleon is important. Your styles are amazing. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> I mean that everything is different boat, but there's an underlying thing, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and here's the thing is like, I feel like I just finally nailed down a style. Like within the past maybe year or two. I'm 31 years old, y'all. <laughs> like, like <laughs> I've been making art since I was a little kid. And I feel like I finally hit my stride with like having a style. But I also still like to step outside and just draw, try drawing things in other styles. Like, I, I think it's it's something that like. Don't limit yourself. And I've done this in the past, y'all. I have actually done this to myself. I have shot myself in the foot by going, I want to draw this, but it's not really fitting that like look that I've been doing lately. Like I've been doing a lot of these like line art style pieces and I think like, OK, there was a time maybe five, six years ago where I was like, I just want to draw maybe not even that long, maybe like four, three or four where I was like, I love Babs Tars work so much and I, I want my art to look like that. And so I started doing like all this line art stuff and I kind of stopped doing my, my my more painterly fantasy stuff. Um, and sometimes I'd have an idea for like a, a painterly style thing that I would go, mm, yeah, but it's not really matching the art style that I want to have right now. So if you ever find yourself going like, this is what I want my art to look like, but you can't quite get it to look like that, Stop putting yourself in that box. <laughs> Stop saying, I want my art to look like this and I'm going to make it like just let let your brain kind of flow through different styles and experiment with different styles. And sometimes you will end up landing landing on a new style that's unique to you. And sometimes you'll find that you have a couple different techniques that you can apply depending on the situation, because there's going to be times that you want clean, crispy outlines and and bold comic like shadows. And then there's going to be times that you want to just, you know, have very soft, lineless styles and different situations. Like for me, I'm like my model. I have my crisp line art style. But I don't want that for like my starting soon screen in my Twitter header. <laughs> I want a more painterly badass fantasy art style. Right. So you'll find different applications to those different art styles. So don't don't hold yourself back and think like, I want all my art to look like this. And so that's all I'm going to do. Style varies with medium. I draw traditional a bit different than on my iPad. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like, think about like comic book covers versus comic book pages. Those are like wildly different things, but those artists still need to have multiple styles to fit the different situations. Right. So don't worry about like, I just can't seem to like land on a style. Like the best thing you can do is experiment, experiment, experiment. Try all different things. And each time you experiment, you're going to remember some piece of that is going to stick with you and it will influence the next piece you do. Um, style studies is also a great way. If you if you do have one that you really like, right, you like I, I'm obsessed with this artist's way that they do noses. Fill out a page just like just like how I showed like my college work where you were doing like like life drawings. In addition to like doing fundamental studies as a beginner, once you're intermediate and stuff, start doing style studies. In fact, they do that in college, too. They do that in college, too. They will have they're called master studies and they'll literally be like, I, you see this uh, architecture students had to do this all the time where they would actually I would I worked in a frame shop for a, a small time. And there was always the architecture students that were bringing in their master studies, which is like, I mean, talking Renaissance paintings that they were literally doing like pencil drawing studies of. 
um, like one to one recreations. Uh, and so when you when you hear that that old song and dance of like, um, you actually can't reference things, you actually can't uh, trace, you can't do this. That does not apply to learning. Can you trace a Da Vinci and then go on Twitter and say, yeah, actually, I made this? No. But if you say, hey, this is like a style study I did of, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's different. All right. And and even when when you are like creating stuff, it not most 99 percent of the art you make is not going to be for social media for an end result. It is going to be simply to do it. <laughs> 80% of my projects for my first year of art school were master studies. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. People have been doing master studies since that's how the Renaissance people learned. They literally were doing apprenticeships <laughs> and they were studying their masters and they were probably recreating one to one things back then, too. In fact, I think I remember seeing a few of those in art history where you would see here's an example of one that is a copy of this older version, you know, like that that is just how artists have passed on knowledge for so 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 long. Yeah, I I don't know. There there I, honestly I think that comes from like this weird black and white thinking that we get online where we lose all nuance in conversations online, right? Um and the nuance tends to be gray area stuff. So if you say, "Hey, tracing is bad." People Welcome go, "All tracing Olympics. is bad." It's Space like, "No, no, no." <laughs> Yo, thank you for the follow, Oakman. In fact, if all tracing was bad, you guys wouldn't have any webtoons ever <laughs> because there, every industry in the cre every creative industry uses shortcuts. So not only can you use it to study later, you're going to use it to save time for stuff that you already know how to do. Memes, webtoons, a lot of media. Yep. Tracing. Yeah, exactly. Tracing is helpful if you claim it's yours. It's something else. And the thing is, if you if you are tracing from something that is intended to be an asset, you're good. Like there are things that are like in the clip studio store that are like literally intended to be a base that you will use. Um, same with like stock imagery or one of the best things you can do, go out and take a photo yourself. You know what I do a lot? I take a photo of my own hand and then I trace it because I want to get the pose right. And even though I know how to draw hands and I could do a one-to-one -one study, after a certain point, it's like, I know I can do this. So why should I spend that time doing that? I'm going to save time by, and, and, and especially when you take the photo yourself, you literally own that photo too. So like, there's literally no harm in tracing and tracing well is a skill in and of itself. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Plagiarism bad. Tracing does not equal plagiarism. Exactly. I think there's, there are, there are always nuanced conversations to be had about these kind of things. And sometimes you, you got your art education on DeviantArt where it's a bunch of 14 year olds arguing over what is ethically correct instead of like talking to actual professional artists. <laughs> it's a problem with Internet conversations. Right. And the thing is, those conversations can we can have them all day back and forth on Twitter. But at the end of the day, your favorite webtoon artist is still tracing a reference because otherwise your webtoons would not get, it would take way too damn long. They would never get done, right? <laughs> I spent six years of my early art life on DeviantArt and just don't. Yep, same. It's kind of, honestly, it's kind of dead now, which is good and bad. <laughs> it's bad in that there is a, that was a huge form of community, but I think what has taken up the mantle is places like um, art streamers on Twitch where we can find each other via our discords and we can, we can communicate that way. There are, there are discord communities specifically for artists. Um, there, there are other spaces. It, it's, it's kind of a shame because I feel like that was, it had its potential, um, to maybe just make itself better. And instead it kind of just died and everybody moved to discord, but you know, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> I don't want to like soapbox about the death of DeviantArt today. We're here to learn, not mourn. <laughs> the other thing I would recommend for developing an art style, and this is huge, whether you do this via creating a Pinterest board, whether you do this via making a personal Discord server for yourself and saving things, 
I actually created a Discord server for myself. I think I call it like the junk drawer or something like that because it's just a random mess of crap I need to save for myself. And I make different channels and one of them is uh, art, art resources. One of them's like art inspo. Um, you know, I'll save brushes and stuff I like to art resources. I'll save art inspo. And, and there's tons of different stuff I'll save in there. And it's stuff that I go, I really like the lighting on this. Or I really like the, um, I really like the, uh, the line quality of this one. And like those, like you can never stop observing art and studying art. If you ever want to grow as an artist, doesn't matter what skill level you're at. You will always have an artist or an art piece that will just catch your eye and you go, I love that. Uh, how do I do that? And that's where you can start doing your studies. Um, and just saving stuff. If you ever kind of are like, I want to draw, but I'm just not sure what I want to draw right now. That's when you go to that mood board, you go to your art discord channel and find stuff and go, okay, I really want to try this lighting technique. What can I make with this lighting technique? But yeah. I love, I love Pinterest, especially more so than just the discord thing. And the reason why is because it will start um, algorithmically recommending uh, stuff to you. Uh, so that is, you know, when you find stuff you like, save that. Don't just like it on Twitter and scroll on by. Save that. Save it. Um, create mood boards. And then once you've got this big picture mood board of all the things you like, start to see what they have in common. What is, uh, you know, what is what is something that you're starting to see as a through line between these? And what can you do? And, and what are you not seeing in your own art that you can apply that to? Um, but yeah, honestly, the 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 biggest thing with art style though it it really is it's like do those fundamentals study those do style studies um for me i think like finding a passion finding something you're passionate about drawing is huge for me i've been wanting to do more like monster art more creature design uh and i'm actually taking a course on skillshare about it so like for me i'm like something i want to learn how to do is fantasy art, right? And something that's always inspired me is like the Guillermo del Toro films, his creature designs. <laughs> honey, honey knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Anything they put Doug Jones in. <laughs> um, I love that stuff. I, I'm obsessed with it. And uh, so I actually found a course on here. Yeah. <laughs> That so like for me, right, I'm working on my true form model. I think I've shown you guys that a few times and I even talked about how I'm really struggling with the body design on it. Right. I'm actually really struggling with coming up with how I want the body to look. Uh, and I found a course on here that I think is actually going to help me design my true form model. <laughs> like, no joke. I'm you can see I'm halfway through this class right now. I found this this course by. um Again, Hardy Fowler, I'm act actually huge, huge fan of everything this man has been teaching. He's a concept artist and holy crap. Um, creature painting. And he has this whole lesson on like sh using shape language when it comes to creatures. And like he's like find, you know, animals in real life to ground the design in. So I'm like now all of a sudden I'm going and finding like actual like. I'm finding like animal pictures and like I literally went up and I was like, how do I want the feet to look? And I found I found like uh, I found uh, like emu feet. I really like how emu feet look. So I'm like saving that. So now I'm like saving all these like animal parts for reference. Like I just I'm, I'm obsessed with this class. It's like got my wheels turning on how I want to design um, my true form model. And like I love going down and looking at people's um projects look at all these cool creatures people have have been doing studies of from his course or designing themselves it's literally perfect it's exactly what i needed it's exactly what i needed i was like yes 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 this is what i wanted <laughs> like, <laughs> this is so perfect um so we've we've been talking how useful is skillshare i'm like immensely i wish i had this when i was younger i like I'm actually so jealous <laughs> that this wasn't like available when I was, you know, younger to be able to take advantage of when I was in high school and stuff. I would have been like eating this up. And honestly, it doesn't really matter what age you are, because I now I'm I'm in here learning. <laughs> I, 
I'm in here eating this up right now. So um, I've been recommending throughout, you'll see throughout this VOD, I am recommending relevant classes for whatever topic I'm talking about. Um, so if you missed earlier parts in the VOD, please check out uh, this. I, I, I will also be posting all of my recommended classes in the Discord afterwards. But if you have never taken a fundamentals course, like like this one that I recommended, please, that would be a great place to start. Um, otherwise, if if you have, you know, if you've kind of already done the fundamentals and you're looking at doing something more specific to you, um, like, for example, um, if you are maybe trying to get into character design, right? Um, I saved some of those, too. Like my list here characters and expressions i saved a whole playlist expressive character oh look it's a goblin we have some goblin enjoyers in chat we have some goblin enjoyers in chat <laughs> um character design for animation how to draw a character turnaround if you are if you are someone who needs to draw a ref sheet for your character i'm pointing at you creators in chat who don't have a ref sheet for your character pointing at you aggressively right now this might be one to take, huh? This might be one to take. Yeah, I know you're in chat right now. <laughs> Maybe that's what you set as your goal for this month. If we could all find find one thing that you've really been meaning to get around to with improving your art, right? Find one thing you've been meaning to get around to. Find a Skillshare class for it. And, and post your results in the Discord. I would love to see it. I think we could make a goal this month to all try to push something that we've been trying to learn for ourselves. For me, it's going to be designing that true form model, learning about creature design, not just winging it, but really like studying how are good concept artists doing it. If you're trying to push how to draw expressive characters, maybe this is the one you want to take. If you're trying to get into digital painting, um, I saved a bunch specifically for digital painting and I'm probably going to take all of these. Honestly, I am really excited about these. Um, the also, another thing, a uh, question I get a lot with my art, too, is just like, what program do you use? And what programs do you recommend? I personally use Clip Studio Paint. I have used Photoshop in the past. I still use Photoshop for certain things. But for the most part, all my illustration, I have moved over to Clip Studio. Um, I know a lot of people enjoy Paint Tool Sci, uh, Krita. Uh, there's a lot of free options when it comes to art. I learned, I don't know how many of you are around my age. Uh, I'm, I'm 31 and I learned digital art on GIMP. <laughs> yes, that's what it's called. Uh, it was a free, it's still available, I think. It's an open source uh, uh, digital painting program. I, I learned all my basics on that. Honestly, it's like, it's more about the tools. Uh, <laughs> no, not that. <laughs> I'm in GIMP right now. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. It's honestly, it's got a lot of the, the stuff you need. MS Paint to GIMP pipeline. Yeah. <laughs> I bought Clip a long time ago and still have the file ready to unpack. Let's go. Yeah, I, I, I love Clip. I love Clip Studio. Um, I love the 3D model. We, like we talked about earlier, being able to use reference, being able to just drop a 3D model in there, pose it however you want, and then trace that as a base before you even get started on, on stuff is, is such a huge time saver for me. I've been using the 3D Welcome model stuff a lot. Morganography. Yo, thank you for the follow. Welcome in. The Pavlov conditioning is kicking out. I hear you. I'm compelled to make progress on my art projects. Let's go. Yippee. That makes me so happy. GIMP 2.1 is around. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that ugh. that was what I learned on. And honestly, I think I think whatever you even if you can't afford a paid art program right now, there are so many great free options and whatever you learn in any creative program will still apply to other ones. The only thing you're going to have to reuse it, relearn a little bit is the UI, but the fundamentals are going to be the same across the board. So no matter what you start in, you can always move to something later if you decide to take, you know, uh, if you decide that art is going to be a bigger hobby or a career path for you, you can always upgrade later. But start free. Start with a free program. Uh, if you have an iPad, Procreate is free. And there's a ton of stuff. I saw, oh, I saw so many classes on Skillshare geared towards Procreate. Procreate has a ton of learning resources. Um, I think because of the fact that it's a free program and a lot of people have iPads and it's maybe a little bit more accessible because a lot of people 
maybe wouldn't have like a drawing tablet specifically around, but they will have an iPad. Um, so you don't necessarily have to like invest in something specifically for making art. You can just pick up something that you already have. Don't spend money on your hobby until you are sure that you like it. You know, try and start free if you are unsure. Um, you can because none of the time spent creating, even if it's in a, a program that you're going to change to a different program later, is ever uh, a waste of time. Never a waste of time. You will always be learning. Again, Clip Studio is my my weapon of choice uh, for intermediate. Welcome to the Vanderwolf Restless Moon. Learning the art raid. Incoming Let's raid go. VT. Yippee! Welcome in. Speaking speaking of like improving art, Vanderwolf has been a regular community member this whole time and has been posting in the Year Creations. And I've literally watched Vanderwolf's art improve over the past year. Vanderwolf's, I like. It's just you. You are a testament to practice is so important. Like you can just you can literally watch your art improve if you scroll through the your creations and filter by Vanderwolf's posts. Like it's so that's what I love so much about like sharing with the community and stuff is like getting to see progress. It's so cool. You saw that? Of course. I always look in the your creations section. I love seeing everybody's work and and everybody's like there's so many amazingly talented creative folks in my in my community, which is why I wanted to do a chat like this today. It's exactly why I wanted to have this conversation is because I see you guys improving and working to improve. And I want to share, you know, whatever tips I have to help with that. <laughs> my art is annoying. Oh, my gosh. This is this. Oh, this is perfect. This is perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Atlas, for the perfect segue. The perfect segue. <laughs> Welcome to the moon base. Start my art is annoying me. Because I finally found out how to draw actual noses and now I can't again. Oh my god, perfect segue. My next topic was, why do I hate my art so much? I struggle with improving my art. The cycle! It's time for the cycle! Get ready, y'all! Get ready! Actually, I have, a, I have a slightly modified version of this. I'll show it in a second. <laughs> Alright. Art is a cycle. Sometimes you draw really well, but sometimes you feel like you can't draw at all. In reality, you are always slowly improving. It's just a cycle of seeing versus drawing that makes you think you are doing worse. Understanding how this works can help an artist power through art blocks for you is simply improving your ability to see and not get too cocky during art highs. <laughs> so essentially what's going on here is. It's Jover. We're so back. It's Jover. We're so back. And that's going to keep going forever your entire life, no matter no matter what skill level you're at. <laughs> this is this is the, the chart. <laughs> Where is this PNG? It, if you do exclamation point cycle, exclamation point cycle. Is the original creator of this. Um, this is please bookmark this bookmark this for yourself. Um, <laughs> and yeah, too real. Sedivan is a musician. This is not just digital art or visual art. This is every creative endeavor you will do in your life. It could be music. It could be, you know, it, it could be like anything. It could be writing. It could be any, any sort of like skill that you are developing. This will apply to, um, I, I know they say art is a cycle, but on God, this is just, this is. This is any skill. Perceived skill is when your art is actually better than your ability to like evaluate and perceive art. So it says when you can draw better than you can evaluate how good you are. This is an art high. It says, wow, I'm getting so good. This is the best picture I've ever made. I am currently in one of these right now. <laughs> I am currently in the Oh, fuck. Yeah, we're so back. <laughs> we're so back, baby. We're so back. That latest piece I made, I, I finally I was like, I feel like my art's leveling up. I feel really good about this. So unfortunately, you know what that means? <laughs> Pretty soon I'll be hitting one of these. But because I know it's coming, it it softens the blow. Being hyper aware of this can actually help a lot um, because when it happens, you go. All right. It just means like my my observational skills have improved. And you can kind of like logic your way out of feeling like crap about it. 
<laughs> at least I can. I I don't know. Like I, it, it's like one of those like, all right. I hate this, but I know why I hate this. So I don't feel as like I don't feel like a failure. I don't feel as much of a failure about it. Um, so when you go into that next section, I feel this with video editing. Exactly, it applies to anything. Moon. Me pros underscore blue moon has requested okay. a phone tube. It's time for me to do the the like make sure everybody's still paying attention moment. All right. Hey, you guys listening? Are we listening Welcome to the presentation? To the Paladin Max. I'm shaking the keys. I'm shaking my groan tube. <laughs> Everybody pay attention. Jingle, 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 jingle. <laughs> I'm in that it's Jover phase right now. And that's what growth feels like. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I, I, oh, I've been there more times than I can count. Um, and I have actually, uh, let me pull something up. I forgot to pull this up before stream, but there is an Ira Glass quote that I think is also very important. This is a quote. It's a bit of a longer quote. Yes, and Ivan knows what I'm talking about. This is my favorite. I've actually talked about this on the channel before, but it's been a long time and it's extremely relevant. Um, I believe this was actually written in regards to creative writing, I think. Um, but again, applies to any any creative endeavor. Um, so this is what what we call the gap. OK, and I think it honestly is kind of referring to this chart. It ties in so well with this chart. Um, and that gap is the it's jover <laughs> right <laughs> we're this is this quote is it is it is referring to the section of this chart right here okay um so this is from ira glass it's often shortened to a quote called the gap nobody tells this to people who are beginners i wish somebody told me all of us who do creative work we get into it because we have good Welcome taste to the moon base amanda Stree. but there's this gap for the first couple years, you make stuff, it's just not that good. It's trying to be good. It has potential, but it's not. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game is still killer. And your taste is why your work disappoints you. A lot of people never get past this phase. They quit. And remember that line, because I'm going to come back to that in a moment with a follow-up. Um, a lot of people never get past this phase. They quit. Most people I know who do interesting creative work went through years of this. We know our work doesn't have this special thing that we want it to have. We all go through this. And if you are just starting out or if you're still in this phase, you got to know it's normal. And the most important thing you can do is do a lot of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week you'll finish one story. In our case, maybe that's, you know, a sketch. Finish one sketch, whatever. It's only by going through a volume of work that you will close that gap. And that is so true. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> we'll touch back on that as well. Um, it's only by going through a volume of work that you will close that gap and your work will be as good as your ambitions. And I took longer to figure out how to do this than anyone I've ever met. It's going to take a while. It's normal to take a while. You've just got to fight your way through. That is the gap. That is the gap. Um, it is... It is so, so important. And it applies to so much. Yes, that I remember I heard this quote from my uh, college art professor, and that stuck with me the rest of my life. Literally, it changed how I view myself, and it gave me so much more confidence in pushing through my work and getting experimental and just making things, even if I hated it, just doing it. Yeah, thank you, Decay, for the quote there. This helps me understand more with my writing. Like, holy cow, I've been writing forever. Doing focus times have helped me so much. Yes, 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 yes. Need to hear this for my career path. I'll be incorporating this quote in my classroom. Oh, that's awesome. Yes, please do. Because it, when, when I heard it in the classroom, it actually, like, actually blew my mind. And I, I think I've heard it separately from this chart. And I think that they, they pair together really nicely. I'm a graphic designer struggling to graduate right now. Thank you so much for sharing. Of course. Yes. No, like this is, uh, it changed my life. And that's why I like sharing it is because it, it actually, like, I remember it Welcome when I'm feeling like crap about Bobby my art. Underscore. I just think about that canon event. <laughs> there was a canon event. <laughs> I cannot intervene. <laughs> um, and 
I think an example of this that I experienced that I can think off the top of my head and something I can I've talked about with, you know, people in my community that are learning live 2D and stuff is why I say to start small with a model <laughs> is because it's because by the time you finish a piece, you will have a small amount of time where you like it and you'll be riding that high. That's me right now. Welcome I'm to riding my days, high. Including zero. Um, but I have actually already reached the point of the low. It, it, it will. You may think this just happens in waves, but it actually will happen on your individual pieces, too. Like you'll look back at a piece that you were once proud of a little while ago and you'll go hate that. Love this new thing I just made, though, because <laughs> you see how much you've improved. Um, like my model, I already there's so many things I hate about my model. And my first model, my first model was uh i like i think i made i made a half body model i rigged it in about two weeks and i already hated it by the time i was done <laughs> and yet i still used it for a year and i used that that little half body model for a year while i developed my second one because i had learned so much in that first little section that it made me want to redo it and now doing that second one there's already so many things i would do differently with my current one and the only way to get through that is to make a huge body of work, which is why I really recommend if you are struggling to improve on your art, stop trying to make big finished pieces, huge projects. Stop trying to make something that you're like, this is going to be my my masterpiece. Just make something small, make something small, decrease the scope. S make that s scope smaller. <laughs> I know you're a dreamer and you've got big ideas and you've got big plans and you will get there. You will. You will make awesome, huge things. But if you're in that part of your life where you're feeling like I, I hate everything I make, that is not the time to start a big project. That is the time to start noodling around with some little things, little, easily achievable projects. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about this. And this is where I wanted to really talk about um, neurodivergent folks. All right. This is those of us that have ADHD. Uh, those of us that have uh, autism, any kind of neurodivergent issues. We face an additional struggle here um, on several different levels. Um, but two in particular. Um, the first being something called rejection sensitive dysphoria now this is not something that's in the dsm you know it's not like official diagnosis criteria but this is something that has risen from the adhd community and something that we have uh, identified in ourselves and that is helping a lot of us cope with stuff okay so yeah that's where that perfectionist side is coming from all right you are struggling because it's not meeting your perceived standards. Again, that ties back to that chart we were just looking at. And so you think it's not worth it at all. But unless you push through and make more art, you will never get through. You'll never close the gap. The gap. It's the, the Ira Glass quote. Again, it's that gap. Um, but sometimes putting a name to it will help. So as, essentially what happens when you are experiencing rejection sensitive dysphoria is you're going to have you how do i word this one of our biggest struggles is emotional regulation um and it is what it what happens is we have big emotional responses to a perceived or real failure and it can actually be debilitating there are two typical responses to this all right so the first is when this comes to not necessarily art, but when it comes to like relationships and stuff, uh, <laughs> this is going to be a little bit of a tangent um, is you get so afraid of rejection that you become like a people pleaser <laughs> and you, you do things not necessarily for yourself, but for others. This I'm, I'm reading something from the ADHD manual.com. So I'm going to share this link. I would encourage you all, if you have ADHD um, to read it, Welcome to the moon at some base. point. No wife, but I will cover a little piece of it. Um, it says, um, <laughs> there's a good reason why so many people with ADHD become comedians, actors, advocates, or entertainers slash performers. 
They're very accustomed to anticipating fulfilling others' needs in order to survive. Were some of you maybe relating a little too heavily to Bo Burnham's Inside special? <laughs> you may have ADHD. <laughs> um, <laughs> Youch! <laughs> uh, but what that can look like when it comes to, like, rejection, responding to rejection and failure in, like, art, too, is sometimes it can it can become like, I'm not making art that others will like. I'm not making art that others will like. And so their perceived, their perception of me is what I'm worried about more so than my own perception of me. Um, and I think that is, that is something that will add an extra layer of hurt and fear in presenting your art to others. Right. Um, <laughs> And I think that especially is hard when you're trying to become a content creator uh, based around art. So would you guys believe when I first started streaming, I had no intention of really streaming art because I was too afraid. I, I actually was just going to be a I was actually just going to be a video game streamer and maybe some like D&D &D stuff. That's what I started with when I was a face cam streamer. I was just doing that. I actually was so nervous about my art process. I was afraid to let anybody see because guess what? I will have sketches that I abandoned because I just am having an off day in art. And I've been so I was so afraid of having one of those days on stream. It's it's one of those things where like your rejection sensitive dysphoria will like step in and make you worried about your per how others perceive you. You will be so afraid of how others perceive you and it will hinder your growth. You will basically hold yourself back from growth if you um if you let that part of yourself win. So like, I wasn't going to be a creative streamer because I was so afraid of, like, making a mistake on stream of, like, uh, of making, uh, you know, not having my art be perfect all the time on stream. And so I almost just, like, didn't want to do it at all. And <sighs> that was rough um, getting over that. And I don't really have, like, a great like way to get over that it's something that we all have to find some way to overcome we all have to climb that mountain um for me it was watching other art streamers that were doing just kind of like doodle style streams and weren't really making like a big finished piece that they were gonna put on twitter and sell prints of and blah, all this like like you know that's cool too i just did you know that but like watching people who take the art a little less seriously not that they not maybe that's not the word it's more about people who take the art more about the journey than the end result was what got me there right like it was it was like okay people like seeing artists struggle too because it makes it feel relatable you don't have to be perfect you don't have to be perfect all the time and like Something about ADHD makes us do that because we're so we have such a huge emotional reaction to rejection and critique. Um, and that is another difficult part of being an artist. Um, so so I talked about how there's two responses to RSD. You typically either please everyone or you stop trying. You get frustrated and you give up. You literally like um, like in that article I shared they talked about how like they didn't get their driver's license until they were two months away from graduating. Cause they were so scared about failing it. They're like, this is, this is such a roadblock for all of us, me included all of us. Like you get frustrated that you don't get it perfect in the first try and you give up. You just stop. Um, and I have had some hobbies that I've dropped for that, which is fine. Cause it was fairly inconsequential, but if it really is your passion and this is like your main passion, don't let that don't let that hold you back. It is it is extremely hard to get over that. Um, again, I don't really have the best tip. Of, of like, here's how to do it, because it's going to be different for everybody. Everybody's going to find their own different motivations. Right. Um, for me, it was seeing other people draw make mistakes and going like oh that's okay people like watching i guess i i enjoyed watching that too 
Like it, the process is fine. Sometimes we just want to hang out and make art together. Sometimes streaming art isn't necessarily about like, you know, this big end game thing. It's more about just like hanging out together and doing stuff together. Right. And that I think kind of like leads me into my next topic. My next question is um how do i find motivation i can't seem to finish any projects i think that is like a perfect lead on from the effects of rsd being like the give up part right like the the i just won't do it because i not getting it perfect on the first try that how do i find motivation i can't finish my projects ties into that right because a lot of times we give up because it's not perfect um i talked about this before but about like narrowing your scope of your project trying to make something small just doodling um there's something that i like to do and that honestly this was huge for me okay turn art into a stim we all like to stim together right we all find things that we do together for me things that i want to improve at i will just turn into a stim um like what about when you don't like your doodles just make them anyway but take them less seriously. Draw something on a post-it note. You will have you will have less expectation of it if you are drawing something on a post-it note or in the margins of your notebook at work or or college or whatever it is. Purposely draw on stuff that you don't take as seriously. Yeah, if you don't Son, yes, exactly. If you're finding you don't like a doodle, you're not doodling, you're trying to make art. Yep, you're no longer practicing, you're trying to make an end result. Stop that. Just draw. Make bad art. Just make bad art. If you struggle with making bad art, if you're looking at your sketchbook and you want your sketchbook to be all perfect and you're like, you're afraid of messing up your aesthetic sketchbook that you want to post on Instagram, don't draw on your sketchbook then. Go grab, go grab a piece of lined paper, not even graph paper. Sometimes people take themselves too seriously in graph paper. Go find crappy Walmart sketchbook, notebook, piece of crap, a composition book or something. Um, find post-it notes, stuff that like you, you know, cannot be a finished piece of art. Maybe, maybe you'll use it later as a base or redraw it in a, in a different way. But take yourself less seriously. Couldn't draw on my tablet because of the perfection thing. Started drawing in my line, lined notebook and I felt relief. That's a great tip. If you're struggling at digital art, do some traditional doodles. Because, again, it is not about the medium. It is about the fundamentals. Like we talked about earlier, it's about learning the fundamentals of art, about line weight, about form and value. Those are all important things that will apply no matter what medium you're working in, whether you're drawing with a mechanical pencil on a piece of of a uh, napkin or whether you're making a piece on on MS Paint, you know, that sometimes that can help, too. If you're trying to do digital art and take yourself a little less seriously, maybe just pop open like whatever the Welcome crappiest the program Fancy. you have for drawing is on your <laughs> on your computer find something with like the fewest amount of tools possible and just like doodle in like the silliest way best art is in the margins of math notes something about the informality of a random doodle in the corner literally i could pull up a mountain of sketchbooks that i have right now that are just notes from either my past jobs from meetings or from college even going back to high school, I've always been doodling. And when I say that, dr make drawing into a stim, that's what I mean, doodling. Um, some of, uh, how can I compare? I could compare this to, I have improved my singing over the years by uh, singing when I do dishes because I need something to like stimulate me when I'm cleaning. So I need to like do something, but I can't, it can't be something with my hands. So I sing. That's what I do to like keep myself busy because I, I'm I've got extreme ADHD and I need to do something to give me dopamine. Singing becomes that stim that I do. I stim by singing. You can stim by drawing. Turn the thing that you're trying to develop a skill in into something that you can just like do passively with low expectations for yourself. Rather than sitting down and go, I am going to draw now. Maybe you're going. I want to 
want to watch a YouTube video, but I can't just do one thing at once. Then I might experience a thought. <laughs> God forbid. I don't want to think. I have to do something with my hands. So pop up a YouTube video that you've been wanting to watch and start doodling while you're doing that. Singing Welcome while doing art. Yeah, you could do both. <laughs> Because if you if you find that you are struggling to get motivated, stop saying, I'm going to sit down and do art right now. It's not going to happen. You know why? I'm going to hit you with another one. Mothma, I think you're the follow, by the way. Welcome in. I'm going to hit you with another one. A little thing called PDA. And no, it's not kissing in public. I'm talking about pathological demand avoidance. Welcome to the moon base. Yo, Princess thank you for the follows. Welcome in. Have you guys heard of pathological demand avoidance? This one is a little, I believe, a little more towards autistic experiences than ADHD. Um, but it can be experienced by both. Um, pathological demand avoidance. Actually, no, I think, yeah, I think this is both. I think this falls under the, the middle um, the, the, of the Venn diagram of, of odd, odd DHD. Um, Pathological demand avoidance is when Welcome somebody tells you you have to do something, you don't do it. You won't do it. <laughs> you refuse. And it can come from any anything. Um, how do I how do I put this? You don't want to do you don't want to take the trash out because it is a demand made of you. Not even if somebody tells you you have to. I'm not talking about like somebody said, hey, go take the trash. I mean, it, this applies as well. But if someone goes, if you were about to take the trash out and then somebody comes up to you and goes, hey, can you take the trash out? You go, well, now I'm not going to do it. Now I don't want to do it. That's PDA. But also there's a more internal form of it that can happen, which is basically like, I know that there is an expectation of me to take the trash out right now. And so I don't want to do it. Um, and that can also apply <laughs> attacked, <laughs> feeling attacked. I'm sorry. I told you guys this was going to happen. Um, it's, it's different from executive dysfunction because it almost, here's where it's rooted in. Okay. Executive dysfunction roots a little differently from PDA and that executive dysfunction is that like, you actually do want to do the thing but you can't seem to get up and do it. That is the lack of executive function, right? The difference between that and PDA is that what PDA is rooted in is a fierce need for autonomy. It is an extreme over the top emotional reaction for a need for control in your life. And honestly, that's where most psychological things stem down to is I feel out of control of my own existence. And so this is a way I can latch on to control. Um, and PDA can manifest in that way of like, I don't want to be told what to do. I want to have control over my life. I want to be in charge. Um, and so some of you may refuse to do the fundamentals today just because I told you to. <laughs> you may be like, well, I, I don't want to study the fundamentals now because now I, you told me I have to. Um, and here's how you can get around that stumbling block. Um, now, I struggle with this constantly. I struggle with this constantly. Learned yet another thing to look at in the mirror. I told you guys, I'm sorry. I hope this helps, though. I think, I think something, it can help you. Sometimes having a name for the beast helps you defeat it, you know? Like, <laughs> I'm in danger. <laughs> the fact that I legit had that same exact thought earlier. Yeah, yeah. So... That's why it's different from executive dysfunction. There, executive dysfunction, you will probably experience it if you experience PDA, but they are different feelings. They're totally different feelings. One of them is, I really want to, but I can't. And the other one is, well, I should, but I don't want to because I should. Hmm. Hmm. It turns our brains into little brats. <laughs> um, but yeah, so sometimes... One is apathy, the other is rebellion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is, it is, it's rooted in the need for control, yeah. And, and I think that we can struggle with that when we're trying to develop creatively because we want to, we want to get better. Um, 
but we hate that we can't just do the things that we want to do right now. We hate that the teacher is saying, yeah, yeah you got to you got to draw a bunch of squares and circles. And, and I'm like, ah, fuck that. I want to be instantly good at it. I want to be instantly good at it because of a combination of my PDA and my and my rejection sensitive dysphoria, my RSD. These two three letter acronyms are fucking me up when it comes to art improvement. <laughs> No study, no improve, only success. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are two wolves inside of you. One is a brat and one is frozen. Congratulations, you have both. <laughs> no practice, only get better. Exactly. How do you get past that, right? How do you get past the rejection sensitive dysphoria and the and the and the demand Welcome avoidance? Welcome to the moon base. Devil Thank you for soul. the follows. Welcome in. Um for me, there was two ways. And obviously, you're all going to have to find your own ways of getting over it because we all have our, our ways and you'll never be fully over it. I, I don't want to make it sound like you can cure this. This is something you're going to face the rest of your life. Um, if you are neurodivergent and sometimes medication can help, but a lot of times it's more coping skills that are going to help you. Here are the coping skills that have helped me. One of them is find internal motivation structured around satisfying curiosity rather than a specific end result. And what I mean by that is challenge yourself with Instead of going, sitting down and going, I want to draw, how can I, I want to draw, I just don't know what to draw, or like, I, I'm, I'm going to draw today, and then you sit at the little blank page, and you're just like, huh, I don't know what to do. Instead, find something you're curious that you're capable of, that you can prove to yourself that you can do, and then try to meet that challenge. Um, because when you have ADHD, there are only a few ways to create self-motivation, internal motivation. It needs to be urgent or it needs to be new and exciting or it needs to be challenging. Um, if it's mundane, if it's repetitive tasks, if it's something you already know you can do, you won't do it. If it's something you're curious about the fact that whether you could do it or not, now, now we have a little bit more motivation. Um, but try to satisfy curiosity. Go, I wonder if I could draw a, if like, like this ties back to me saying, like, doing style studies and stuff like that. Like, if you don't know what to draw, go back to those fundamentals, do a style study. Um, like, I wonder if I could, I saw this one lighting effect earlier, and I wonder if I could pull off an art with that piece instead of going, Welcome I to want it to, I Red want to make something one. I'm going to post to social media, be like, I'm curious if I like if I could learn this new program today. I'm curious if I could learn this specific aspect of Clip Studio. Today I'm going to learn how to use the 3D model prop uh like props in Clip Studio and I'm going to I'm going to just attempt that. Or I'm going to try out some different brushes. Like it's it's Something where you get get your motivation away from the end piece and aim it at the process and being curious about the process, because that's what makes me want to do art is like I found. OK, part of part of like the um, me making that piece or I, I'm an artist. I could have made myself a starting soon screen literally any time over the past year and a half. And I haven't. Why? I didn't have a motivation to do it. Um. But I gave myself a little a little goal, too, of like, I want to do something big for 10K. But yeah, this makes me want to try CSP. Yeah, exactly. Or like for me, like I didn't. Um, oh, God. OK, here's here's where we'll get into real extreme motivation, right, is finding passion um, and external motivation through community. Um, so like internal motivation, you either need to satisfy curiosity, whether that's finding a new program that you're excited to try or a new technique that you want to try, stop worrying about the end result and worry, focus more on a thing that you want to teach yourself, a thing that you want to see if you're capable of accomplishing. Because you'll get the dopamine more from learning how to do the thing than you will from making a piece that you're proud of, because sometimes that'll cause those roadblocks. But if you achieved your goal of, hey, I didn't like the piece, but I did learn how to use line stabilization today. Okay, now I've got my dopamine hit. 
Structuring about around satisfying curiosity will help a lot because that's again when we go back to the beginning of the stream where I talked about how I learned art, it was like being fascinated by digital art and this new technology and learning things. That's where my motivation came from. I didn't go, I want to make beautiful things. I was like, oh, I want to learn how to make beautiful things. I don't want to make beautiful things. I want to learn how to make beautiful things. So that is a really good way to structure your your Re, I don't know, reset your brain uh, into making something when you're getting stuck and going, I don't know what to draw. Um, the other ways that you can kind of get around that are finding external motivation, especially for, for those who are neurodivergent. We've talked about this a lot on my channel. Some of you are doing it right now. It's a thing called body doubling. Uh, if you're sitting down and going, I can't seem to draw right now. Or whenever you make time to make art, you just can't seem to do it. Stop doing, like, like I said earlier, stop being like, I'm going to draw right now. And instead, flow with your brain. Um, I put on art streamers, and suddenly I am inspired to make art. S literally, it will, it will the, com the sense of community of other, other creators making something, they'll say something that makes me go, oh my god, I should draw that. And boom, suddenly I've made art, like... Some of you just by having this conversation suddenly went, oh, I feel like drawing right now. And I haven't felt the like I haven't wanted to do that in a while. Awesome. Then you have found a cheat code. Go find art streamers. Or if it's more this kind of content, if you find yourself just like listening to me talk, maybe podcasts, maybe maybe you just need to put some kind of media up and watch that and then let yourself draw passively while you do that. Right. I have a good example of curiosity-based motivation. When I made Elden Ring Grandma Moon Giga Chad meme, I needed to learn how to make a screen and screenshot grayscale. And I was hype motivated to learn how to do grayscaling color saturation and banged it out in like 30 minutes. And now I know how to do that thing. Exactly. Literally even just making a silly little meme, you will learn a skill in that and you'll find the motivation to learn when you didn't before. If you sat down and say, I want to get better art, it's just too broad. It's just too broad to sit there and say, I'm going to take time today to do to get better at art. Like, oh, that's so hard to do. But if you're hanging out with somebody and they say something that is so funny and you just want to draw it because you think it'd be really funny. Perfect. You have now just like motivated yourself to make something very unserious and maybe you'll learn something in the process. I learned how to use after how to use After Effects to make stupid meme videos. I feel that exactly like find stuff that you don't have as much pressure on the end result because it's meant to be silly and fun and you will and you will learn gartic phone exactly you could literally improve your art skills like hand over foot by just playing gartic phone with your friends on the reg genuinely gamify it make it make it not about the end result make it about the journey all of that will contribute there's no such thing as like wasted time when it comes to making art and and i i've my my friend Julie, she's talked about this where she's like, I just can never finish my projects. I got to finish my projects. I never finish my projects. I'm like, who cares? You don't have to finish it. No, actually, I, I know what you're thinking that I'm going to say, finish your projects, do it. I'm going to be like, no, that was not a waste of time. And maybe you've grown since that. And we could go back to our chart, right? Maybe the reason you don't want to finish them is because you grew so much. You grew so much that now that is no longer to your standard. But that doesn't mean it was a waste of time just because you never made it in a way that was postable. I think we live in a weird sort of era of creativity where because the art that we see is on social media, we think that we have to make art for social media. And while that might be a good motivation for you, it may also hurt you. Because again, the rejection sensitive dysphoria, if you post something and it doesn't get the reaction that you were hoping for, that's going to make it harder to post next time. Not saying you shouldn't ever post your work, but don't necessarily create work with the end goal of if this doesn't get a bunch of likes, I suck. Or, you know, like I'm going to post, I'm making this in order to post it. Post it if you're proud of it. Post whips. Yes. Post, post sketches. Just. Just like don't let social media guide your idea of what the art process is like, because we all every artist has tons of unfinished projects that we never posted and they wouldn't ever get to the point of making that badass art that you loved if they hadn't have gone through that body of work. 
So going back to this chart, right? Um, with the, the perceived skill and the perceived lack of skill, we all go through this. We all go through those wild swings. Um, and I think that's where if you like find the different motivation, because if you, if you rely on internal motivation during an art low, you're going to struggle. So that's where um, I think going to the external motivation to body doubling to working on projects together with friends, community, you know, take, take initiative with that, that your creations channel, use that as motivation to work on your own stuff and post it there. Um, because it's a little smaller than maybe posting to, uh, you know, social media. Maybe, maybe it feels a little less of like a rejection. Uh, if, if we don't get a lot of reactions in a discord channel versus on like a, a social media site, right? Like, I think we all, we all, like have this really high expectation of what it's going to be like when we post to social media and then we get really sad when it doesn't do what we wanted it to do because rejection sensitive dysphoria once again. Um, and, you know, I think if we take the motivation away from getting likes on Twitter or, or Instagram or, you know, views on tiktok and pushed it more to like did i learn something during this did i learn something during this piece did i gain a skill do i feel more confident in in an ability after doing that um you will get the dopamine hit from that instead of from whether people liked it on social media or not i get so much energy body doubling art because a friend is doing it on stream yep exactly yep body doubling is huge uh for any, and it doesn't even have to be like the same thing, right? Like it could be, I, I will be watching somebody um, do art and that, that will be like, I'll video edit it. I'll video edit during that or something. Like I'll, I'll do something that I've been putting off um, because I see them accomplishing a goal and I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be productive while they're being productive. Um, and it feels more like it's, a backseat to whatever they're doing instead of putting the pressure on myself. Like I'm going to do this right now. Instead, you're like, well, they're I'm already sitting here watching them do something. So I might as well do something while I'm here. And that sort of reframing can help you get over a lot of hurdles. Silent chat workspaces has done a lot for me. Yep. Huge, huge. Like, I think that's what really got me into watching Twitch a lot more was really just like, hanging out while other people were doing stuff it kind of feels like a discord call but less pressure because like if i'm again tying back to those of us who are who are neurodivergent we struggle with socializing right um we can struggle with um communicating and <laughs> even sometimes that like fear of acceptance of fear of of like we conversation can be a struggle right because we're afraid we're going to say the wrong thing um, but we still have a desire to socialize. It's just in a different way. Right. Um, and so hanging out during like Twitch streams can be a nice low energy, low demand way of socializing and getting that sense of community and, and like using that to be productive. Um, cause I go like during the day, I definitely have like a lot of times where I basically go like nonverbal. Right. And I'm just like, I, I can't, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to, um, I don't want to speak, but I still want to like, I'm still, I don't want to be lonely. I don't want to isolate, but I also don't have the energy to be with people right now. And I think that's like the beauty of finding like Twitch streamers and hanging out in art channels and stuff. That's a great way for you can find that like motivation. DM do you another another girl good chart girl boss. Oh boy, let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Gomi just sent me this. Oh hey, it's my art improvement. Oh, uh, what the fuck was that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Real, that's so real. <laughs> that's so real. Oh my god. It 
it will always be a cycle. And and here's here's something I will say as far as like motivation. I'm going to go back to to this, but as far as motivation and just having moments where you're just like, I just can't draw. Sometimes it is burnout. Sometimes you are going through burnout and no amount of community or um or like forcing yourself to work or any of that will work. Sometimes you just need to heal. Sometimes you simply need to truly rest. And I know that is tough because a lot of us feel this like uselessness if we're not being productive. Um, but you do need to give yourself a break and know that no matter how long you go without drawing, no matter how long you go, you are still an artist. Um, if you guys want an example of that, I worked in corporate uh, graphic design for many years. I was in a, I was for like pretty much after I got out of college, I went to a design, not design. It was like just a marketing agency in general. And then after that, I went to like an e-commerce thing. Um, and when you are neurodivergent, just existing in like those kind of spaces in these like high social demand spaces and like giving all of your creativity to your job. Welcome to the moon. Um, Shanai sure. You may find there isn't anything left after that and your batteries left over to create once you get home. Some for a lot of people they say art is therapeutic. It can help with the stress. Um for some of us, for some of us, that's actually it's it's actually going to hurt because we'll only push our burnout further. Uh and so you may need to just simply actually truly rest. And sometimes that will take years to heal. And there is no, there, there is not a, here's how you get around it because it just takes time. It takes time and you need to stop burning both ends. You need to actually lighten up the load on yourself. And, and that's the only way that you can, you can get around it. And, and sometimes we, you know, for me, it just became like, I just could, I could not do, I was making, let's see, I think I made art once a year for like six years there where I just like made art like once a year. And I wasn't even, I was doodle, but the thing is I was doodling in my notebooks the whole time. I was constantly in my, in my corporate work environment, still using it to like stim, but I wasn't making any finished pieces and I wasn't doing it as a hobby when I got home. I simply just played video games. Or, you know, like that I was experiencing extreme severe burnout. And the only way for me to get around that was to leave the work situation that was causing the debilitating burnout. And I wish there was a better answer and maybe there is and I just don't know it. But for me, it was like, I just can't. I just can't um, exist in this situation in corporate life and still create so i didn't start to heal until after i left and now in the past like, here's here's what's crazy is like you know how there was always like those twitter things that are like um art versus artist and it was like person in the center and like nine pieces of art around them i never could do those because i never had a body of work that i could actually present i was making literally literally like one piece a year so if you are sitting there thinking, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm not making enough art, so I'm not really an artist anymore, I guess. No, you may be experiencing burnout. And sometimes burnout is not like, I'll take a week off and I'll be fine. Nope. <laughs> Sorry. It's going to take longer than that. If you're deep in, if you're deeply depressed or in a deep state of burnout, no, no amount of practice or external motivation is going to help because you have got to maybe i don't know you might need some therapy you might need to um you know you might need to work through your mental blockage before you can work on 
this like it's like a symptom of something deeper, right? It's a symptom of something deeper. And so you can't just treat the symptom. You need to treat the root cause. You need to work on yourself. Exactly. You might need therapy. You might need to find coping strategies. You might need to just do some self searching. Speaking of art and professional circumstances, RSD sucks so bad when you're trying to get commissions. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Like I that's why I really never like did commissions. <laughs> One and that the other side of it was like it's hard to it's hard to market yourself. It is what I miss. We're just talking about like people who are struggling to make art for long periods of time and how sometimes it's not a matter of finding motivation. Sometimes it runs deeper than that. Now, I've, I talked a little bit earlier about there are several ways you can try. But if none of those work, if you still just can't get the motivation, sometimes you are going to have to treat your mental health situation before you can become a better artist um because you just can't find the motivation to draw um and a lot of times that will translate to more things than just creativity right you will find yourself having a hard time even finding the motivation to eat let alone draw so don't get down on yourself for not being able to like continue your passions when you are in a state of you know mental disarray right like if you if you are struggling just to live you're not going to have time to do your passions you're not going to have the motivation and that's okay it's normal uh and you will get through it you will get through it because look i i what i say i think it was like six or somewhere between six and eight years i gotta go look at my timeline here but i know however long it was that i was working in corporate life i wasn't creating i was not creating i made a couple pieces here and there here and there and now in the past year, because I have found community, because I have found a way to um, find motivation through making fan art of my friends in the VTubing community, through um, making, finding excitement and curiosity in learning my VTubing programs and testing new technologies and seeing what I'm capable of, I have found that spark again. And I have made more art in the past two years than I have in almost the past decade <laughs> since college. Um, so even if you're struggling right now and you're like, it's been years since I made something, that d doesn't mean that you're not too late. You will find, it will come back. The spark will come back, but you have to fix your heart. <laughs> you have to fix your heart or die, right? That's the the phrase. Fix your heart, fix your mind, find, find the root cause with that blockage uh, before you can work on the skill. So I'll say thanks for explaining this because I've been feeling awful guilty for not working on any of my art for the past seven to eight months and this explains it so well. Yep, don't feel bad. I went years without making, you know, anything. And now I'm making the best work I've ever made in my entire life because I've done a lot of self-searching over the past couple of years. <laughs> be a sad bitch then pick yourself up and remember you're a bad bitch <laughs> yeah exactly i i i found that spark again and i also needed to learn why i was struggling with so much stuff and for me it was like learning getting my adhd diagnosis was that path to healing for me i needed to figure out the name of the beast so i could defeat it you know VTubing helping me find my way back into animation was not something I thought would happen. Yeah, exactly. Something about being in a community full of other people who are all so cool, so talented, so creative. And then that creativity and that, that passion being so contagious. It's community, right? We can all sit in isolation and try to force ourselves to draw and we will get nowhere. But if we all find this community of people that have similar struggles with us that have similar passions as us that have you know like have ideas that make us want to try harder uh not not out of like i don't know like a, a need to be productive but out of a genuine welcome passion and excitement R zero g that was the turning page for me because again part of part of like you know Part of that burnout and stuff can also lead and depression can lead to isolation, right? 
you isolate yourself. It's it's not easy, but like and again, this all of this like goes deeper than just creativity, right? Like this is just mental health at that point, but like doing some self-searching on why you are the way you are can help you find the coping mechanisms to get around it. This comes from someone who uh you know, being being like ADHD and autistic, I struggle where like I have these two sides of me that want to fight or one wants to be really social and then the other side wants to like isolate and never talk to another human being ever again. <laughs> Thanks to you, I started drawing again. Oh, so, so that makes me so happy. What the heck? That makes me so happy. Uh, that's huge. That's awesome. I sent you the results. <gasps> I will check it out after stream. I'm excited. But yeah, I like God knew we would be too powerful, so we had to get a handicap. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like it it is it's a struggle with with like you know socializing where it's like I want to be a community, but I also am so terrified of being in community and so overwhelmed by it. Um, and so I'm glad to have found Twitch because I feel like if if it like it merges that middle ground for me where I can be social to an extent. And I don't have to over push myself. I got to get past stopping at line art. No, you don't. You can simply practice line art. No time is wasted. Some, at some point, the spark will hit and you will find something. You will find something that will get, give you the motivation to, to finish. But don't force it. Don't force it. Don't go, I'm going to finish this for the sake of finishing it. Nope. Let it, let it, if, if you've lost the spark for that piece of art, move on to the next one. It's okay. It means that you either grew past that point or you didn't have the passion to finish that in the first place and you simply wanted to like satisfy some kind of curiosity to get it. It's okay. Move on. Move on to the next piece. Don't worry about it. Every artist has thousands of unfinished pieces and they would never get to the point where on their finished pieces uh, of skill that they have if it wasn't for those unfinished pieces. And holding back and saying, well, I can't move on to the next piece until I finish that last one is going to stop you from creating so much art. It's going to stop you from creating so much art. I, it, you will improve so much faster if you create 10,000 unfinished sketches than, than 1,000 finished pieces. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if I, math is hard. I'm bisexual. I don't know how to math. But you know what I mean? Like, you will improve so much more by making just a ton of unfinished art than, than making constant finished pieces. You will grow so much faster. You will grow at an alarming rate. <laughs> I promise you, you want, what you want to do is create as much art as possible. Not finish as much art as possible. Create as much art as possible. It can literally be doodles. It can literally be doodles. It could be the most half-assed sketches. It could be thumbnails with like the roughest thing that if someone were to look at this and go, I don't even know what I'm parsing right now. It's okay. Because your brain was working out an idea. <laughs> fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Do you know how much this just helped me, Moon? I've been working on two VRC models and one is really bad and one I stopped working on. Once I stopped working on it, it improved. Let's go! Yep. Stop working on the... Stop. Stop going... I should make more art. I have this unfinished piece. Well, I'm not going to make anything until I finish that. Nope. Let it go. Let it die. It's okay. Let it die. Move on. Maybe you'll come back to it later. Maybe you won't. Who cares? Doesn't matter. Also, <laughs> here's a fun little tip. If you have... ADHD, stop saying out loud, I'm going to do this to people because sometimes you'll get the dopamine hit just from talking about it and then you'll never actually finish it. <laughs> sometimes you'll get the dopamine hit from someone going, oh, yeah, that's a really good idea. And then you just won't do it because you because you talked about it. <laughs> don't don't tell anybody about it. Just do it. Just do it. Please, please don't tell anybody about your cool idea. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay, but some of some of you may be the opposite.
opposite. It, you know, Hoshi, if you're the other way around, I have to say it while I'm doing it, so I'm forced to do it. That's okay. If that if that motivates you, cool. Some of us, it will trigger the the PDA. You know why? Yeah, that's why. It's the it's the pathological demand avoidance because now you have created a demand of yourself. You said, I told somebody that I was going to create this, but now I have to create it because I told somebody that. And now I don't want to because that is a demand I have made of myself. So if you have PDA, if you don't have PDA, that won't matter. It will motivate you more. But if you have PDA, <laughs> it may, it may make it worse for you. <laughs> I don't have PDA with other people. I have it with myself. Yeah, pathological demand avoidance can also come from internal demands you have made of yourself or perceived demands. So let's say I go, I'm really excited about this project. I'm so excited. I'm going to tell my friend about this project and they're excited about it. And then they check in with me and go, oh, have you worked on that project? Welcome uh -oh. to the base. You just created a demand of me. <laughs> I know you were just trying to make small talk and show interest in my in my work and you're trying to be nice, but you just made a demand of me and now and now I don't want to do it. <laughs> you activated my PDA trap card. I want to talk about this plan I have, but dear lord, uh, do not follow up with me on it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Sounds like my life. Oh well, <laughs> smile. <laughs> But you know what? That's the cool thing about when you have um, neurodivergent friends. If 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 that kind of thing does become a problem, sometimes you just got to say, hey, guys. Uh, if I talk about something, don't fall, don't try to make small talk with about me, like because I just won't do it. You know, sometimes you just got to talk about what your weird little quirks, your little communication quirks are with your friends and and like just establish that. I have a question related to motivation. I have ADHD and I suspect I have autism, but I'm not tested yet. However, I find it hard to get past my executive dysfunction when it comes to art. Do you experience this and how do you combat it? Yes, executive dysfunction when it comes to art. I've talked about this earlier, but sometimes it's not executive dysfunction. Sometimes it's actually PDA. Um, check out, I, I want you to analyze the, motive, the, the issue. When you are wanting to do art, is there a feeling of like, there's there's kind of two different sides. If it's executive dysfunction, it's that you really, really, really want to do art. Um, but you just can't seem to start it. And and you are like, ah, I just I just don't want to start it. You know, like I just can't. Or are you feeling like you have to and you don't want to because you have to? Like, like, like learning the fundamentals we talked about earlier. Like some people are just like, I don't want to practice. I just want to be good instantly. I really want to do it, but I can't start. Okay, so you are definitely dealing more with the executive function issues. Um, when it comes to executive function, um, there are a few hacks you can do to get around it. Um, it is pretty tough, though. Uh, sometimes you simply have to like, <laughs> wait for a better day sometimes your brain just isn't going to work with you and that's okay if if some if you're trying to force it and it's just really not happening you might just need to um move on to another task but my my recommendation would be to stop trying to do art actively and start trying to do art passively um and what i mean by that is don't sit down and go i'm gonna draw right now instead pop say i'm going to watch my favorite show right now and maybe i'll just doodle in the margins of my notebook while i do that but i'm going to just draw passively while doing something else um or i'm going to watch an art stream and maybe at some point i will feel like this the feeling of body doubling happen and go wow i suddenly feel a little bit more motivated because i'm watching someone else work on art that now i want to work on art um like there, the, the ways that you need to overcome it are to stop making the the immediate goal to work on it right now. But let it happen a little bit more passively or when you have a, a specific passion. Make, yeah, make a low expectation thing however you can. Um, because if you put too much pressure on yourself to like, I'm going to make great art right now. Um, that can just shut it down completely. Make bad art. Yep, we've talked about that too. Just make bad art. 
make bad art. It's okay to force through it. But like, if you're having trouble getting started at all, it's not even about making bad art. It's that you just can't even get the motivation to do it. Body doubling really is a huge help there. Um, I'll set out a sketchbook next to my computer. Yeah, that's a great idea. And and if you find yourself getting too like, oh, I want my sketchbook to like pretty so I can like look through it later and you, you're getting intimidated because you feel like you don't have a good enough idea for your sketchbook, put lined paper, like paper you don't care about and a pen and let drawing become more of a stim for you while you're doing something else. Just passively draw and doodle while you're like watching an art stream. And sometimes, sometimes you can actually find yourself like, uh, just being inspired by something else. Like if, if you're really into, uh, if you have a piece of media you're into right now, fan art, make fan art instead of trying to make something personal for yourself. This is another little hack that I've learned. Sometimes you'll feel a little more excited about something making fan art. And if people tell you that fan art is like, you know, not going to get you a job or whatever, or it's not worth doing. That's BS. I've seen so many people on Twitter land gigs because they made really awesome fan art of something. <laughs> Like literally I see people get jobs specifically because of the fan art that they've made. Um, but also it can help you find community, which can again, start to create that sense of internal motivation. Um, fan art is pure inspiration. Yeah, exactly. If you can like, sometimes it just takes, for me, it was like, I watched arcane and then I went, Oh my God, I love that rendering style so much. And I suddenly felt the need to do art. I've, like watching something that creatively inspires you go watch spider verse literally go watch spider verse i bet you you will come back with like i want to draw something <laughs> is your print art a good example yeah actually yeah <laughs> i literally drew pren because i i love her and and then she hired me to turn it into a commission from there and make merch out of it i'm so ready to make a spider sona after i watch it yeah but yeah, like find something that will inspire you and then make something that satisfies that that inspiration. Like that's actually how I re retextured my model. It was arcane. So when I first did my my what was it? My 1.5 model that was like or my 1.0 model, I rigged it and drew it and then I watched arcane and I immediately made a new texture for it and arcane is to blame. I literally like I watched arcane and thought I want to redo my art and it immediately motivated to like something that I, I, I just so, like something took over me and I hyper fixated on it and I re textured my whole model. Finding a motivation is tough when you have executive dysfunction and sometimes the best thing you can do is rely on your Welcome hyper fixations. <laughs> Work with your brain instead of against it. Um, I think you were really onto something with like leaving a notepad out by your desk Welcome so if you are a, if you have adhd you can st struggle with um object permanence issues and sometimes just like leaving pencils and and pads and stuff in in range like i actually don't i find myself not doodling that much now that i'm not Welcome in to uh under kiwi my you know corporate office anymore where i always had a notepad by me so I think I'm actually going to use your tip there. I'm going to I'm going to place a notepad by my desk, a physical notepad and some pencils and see if I doodle more now. Sometimes that's the bad thing about digital art is you it takes um active thought to pull open a digital program and and start drawing. Uh whereas a sketchbook can encourage more passive art, right? Like it can just be like, "Well, it's there." And sometimes you'll just start messing with it. Um so I think that's a really, really, really good idea. I work with and against. Yeah, exactly. I did the funny once a month clean. So now I can do that. Oh, yeah, I need to do that. My <laughs> I am. My office is a mess right now. <laughs> you guys don't. It's a good thing I'm a VTuber. I can never be a cam streamer. Y'all would see what a mess my office is. <laughs> I have sticky notes, not because I use them for notes, because I can doodle on them or fold them into origami. Yep. Huge, huge. Solutions to have CSP. <gasps> Flash ballad, that's such a good hack. That's a great hack. Have CSP launch on startup so my computer goes, hey, work the moment I open it up. Oh my God, that's huge. 
It's hilarious you do that too. That is so big brain. I'm actually going to steal that hack. Ah, see, you all have amazing hacks too. This is awesome. Holy smokes, that's so big brain. <laughs> that is so good. Creative spaces are often messy. Organized chaos. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Again, I struggle with the executive dysfunction and the PDA when it comes to cleaning. So I really need to um, find ways to like challenge myself when it comes to cleaning uh, so that I can actually do it. Sometimes looking at fan art can invoke envy in me. Is it just me? Uh, I, I don't think that is unusual. I think, uh, I think that is something that we all have to like, s that we'll all struggle with, um, is like jealousy over looking at art and being like, mm, my art doesn't look like that. And I wish it did. And instead find, find ways to take that from a feeling of jealousy and, Mo turn that into internal motivation and what can you learn from it you see art that you like you feel jealousy do a style study really analyze it break it down and learn what is it that i like so much about this and what can i learn from it i'm a perfectionist i think the idea of perfectionism often is rooted in that rejection sensitive dysphoria that we all feel to like I always grew up thinking, ah, I'm just a perfectionist. Well, I'm not actually a perfectionist. I just have like a fear of, of being, um, you know, of my art being perceived poorly. <laughs> and yeah, once I, once I like learned that was like the root of it, that helped a lot. <laughs> it's a cycle. Uh, and you're, when you look at art and feel jealous about it, it is because you now have a higher, ability to see your your taste in art is has gotten good and when you see something and you can sense that your art isn't as good as that you get that wow i suck feeling and you get the art blocks and when i say that like art perception is a skill it really is because trust me i have worked with you know ceos who just don't have the vision for creative you know, stuff. And sometimes they'll look at something that is like absolute crap and be like, eh, it's good enough. And you're just like, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's awful. What are you talking about? And they're just like, run it, you know? And it's like, you, it will actually physically pain you. <laughs> That's something that will happen in the corporate world. It's because they don't have a perception of art. They don't have good perception of art. It's why so many corporate projects get the life sucked out of them, even though their art teams are full of incredibly talented, wonderfully skilled people. Um, it's, it's like they just don't have the vision, right? They don't have the vision. Uh, so the fact that you can even understand that art is really good means that you've got good taste, which means that you have the capability of reaching that level. Right. Like you have the capability because you can recognize good art. You can start to pick apart and analyze what makes it good. And you can start to study that and you have the capability of getting there. But if you let that feeling of jealousy instead of motivating you to like learn from it and just let it block, then you aren't going to grow. Um. Like, it's normal to have those feelings, but how you act on it is the important thing, right? So if you can learn to internalize jealousy as instead of, instead of holding you back, pushing you forward, inspiring you to try harder, to work harder, to learn more, you can use that as a motivator. Um, but if you let it just shut you down and go, ugh, I'll never be that good, you're never going to grow. You have to, have to, have to push through that. You have to um fix your 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 insecurities what's with the dark lore story on youtube i did not foresee this tragic vibe would you believe that it's all a euphemism for my neurodivergence having a dark entity that gives me incredible power at great cost AKA I can hyperfixate to learn something 
but sometimes it means I don't take care of myself in the way that I can and I can actually be damaging to myself. Anyway. <laughs> I totally got that from the video. Good. I'm glad my extremely heavy handed uh, <laughs> like self insert OC <laughs> is reading the way it's supposed to. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I, I think I think we all struggle with looking at other art and feeling jealous of it. I'll say this, too. Um. I noticed that I was able to get over that more after my prefrontal cortex stopped forming. When you get older, <laughs> you will be able to handle jealousy a little bit better when it comes to your skills. Not this isn't a guarantee, but you your your reactions are going to be more intense up until the age of 25. Um, and then. After 25, you might find it a little bit easier to start working on yourself. Um, not that it's a sudden switchover. I'm just saying if you tried pre-25 and you're struggling, um, you know, sometimes after 25, you will really start to find yourself and you'll start to understand yourself better. And you might be able to work through some of those issues. But yeah, I think I think a lot of times that stuff is rooted in the, you know, this when we feel the jealousy and we have an emotional reaction to it um sometimes it's rooted in this rejection sensitive dysphoria emotional response to perceived a real failure can debilitate people with adhd um and the two responses can be they become people pleasers or they stop trying so if you see work that is better than yours and you just go, go well i'll never get there so i'm not even going to try Analyze why you are feeling those feelings. Analyze why you are feeling those feelings. And by knowing the cause of those feelings, can you work on that? Right? There's no like, I'm not gonna, I'm not, there's no like hack. There's no way to be like, here's how you can stop feeling jealous. You're gonna feel jealous. Or here's, here's how you can instantly get over it. We all have to work on ourselves. But the, the, there is a very strong connection between um there's a huge connection between your yourself and your mental health and your creative work because ultimately creative work you know it does come from like your your motivations and stuff are one thing but also just like your drive to your drive to your like reason for it not necessarily motivation and like I'm going to get it done. But your reason for even wanting to in the first place is like part of your co core being. Right. And so if you have um, mental issues like, you know, whether that be depression, whether that be uh, neurodivergencies and the, all the fun little obstacles that we face because of that, that is, of course, going to translate to Welcome your to art base. Stephen do 89. Yo, thank you for the follow. It's just like, you know, they talk about all the time, like, oh, artists have to suffer for their art. They don't. It's just that art is an expression of your inner state, right? And sometimes if your inner state is like rough, right? Like if if it's it's gonna be hard to create art. <laughs> some people say, like, oh, I, I get that out of my system by be create by creating, but for some of us, it actually just stops us from creating at all. I wouldn't say that I see where other people are and I think I'll never get there. It's usually like, I know I can get there, but I plateau in the skill around the immediate, immediate and find it really hard to progress. Yep, that's this. Where, not this one. Well, kind of that one. <laughs> this one. It's this one. You're in this state. We all are constantly. We all are constantly. You will have an art high and an art low. And we mentioned this earlier, but the only way to push through the art low the only way to push through the art low is to make enough art that your art skill improves and you swing back up into your art being better than your perception. And then your perception will grow and it'll you'll notice all the things wrong with your art. And then you'll end up being another art low again. But that cycle is how you grow. Yeah, vent art is a huge it's a huge thing for some people. I never could do it because whenever I have 
the feeling of needing to do vent art, it actually just makes me shut down and not do art at all. But I, I wish I, I wish I had the, <laughs> the ability to do vent art. Probably would make me feel better. Uh, but yeah, this is this is this chart exclamation point cycle for the link to it. This is never going to go away. You could be at the skill level of the people that you're jealous of, and you will still experience that feeling. You're going to chase it. It's going to it's going to happen forever. There is no getting around. There's no getting around art highs and art lows and having that feeling of like, I know I could get better, but I would have to like do a lot of work to get there. Yeah, you are. <laughs> it's daunting. Uh, and that's why having that as your motivator isn't the best idea. Having the having the I want to improve my art as the motivator is a little too broad and a little too daunting. It's kind of like how ADHD sometimes when things are too many built up tasks, we get overwhelmed and just don't do them at all with the executive dysfunction, right? It's too overwhelming. It's, there's too many things that I have to do. Um, even just doing dishes, I'm like, well, first I'd have to, you know, take all the clean dishes out and put those away from the dishwasher. And then I'd have to go through and rinse each one of them. And, and then I'd have to do this and that and the other thing. And like, it just becomes too many steps. And so you just don't do it, right? Welcome to the moon base. Cook That's nothing. executive dysfunction at work is like that overwhelm every little thing's becoming overwhelming because you're seeing it too too like too much at once. Which is why if you're looking at your art as the only way I will get better is if I do a million pieces of art, you're just gonna go, Well, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> Instead, find find a motivation that is either curiosity rooted or passion rooted. And your art will get better while doing that. Or just find a way to create, you know, like I said, turn art into stimming and and just passively create art that you don't care about. <laughs> oh, so not spite then. Listen, if it works for you, it certainly has worked for me in some instances. There are some times that I have absolutely relied on spite to succeed. And if that works for you, you can do it. <laughs> I'm not going to act like it doesn't. Spike can totally be a drive. Yep. What do you do about RSD, which is rejection sensitive dysphoria, if any of you have missed that part, when it comes to sharing your art on socials, if that's relevant enough? No, absolutely. Um, uh, what I'll say is uh, to keep in mind that algorithms are very, very difficult and that it's not always the quality of your art that is going to determine whether it gets like likes and views on it. It is, there are so, so many factors at play. And if you want to get more eyes on your art, um, you might have to like study not just art, but marketing and like research. How are other art pieces posting? Sometimes it's, sometimes it's like you post it at the wrong time of day. Sometimes it's, oh, you didn't write the caption in the right way. Like, don't always take a poor performance of your art on social media as a critique of your art. Because you could literally, and, and I'll say this for years, for years, I was trying to get eyes on my art. And I just didn't, I just didn't, I just could not get, could not get eyes on my art. It wasn't until I started VTubing that I started getting on, like, finally growing a community and growing growing attention on my art but i posted art for years with no like no success at all um and it took like getting getting good at marketing myself and also building a community in other ways through vtubing to get there so like it's not the quality of the art is not a reflection of your likes it is there are way too many factors so if you're if your feeling is my art must suck because I, it doesn't get any likes on social media, you have to have to just like not listen to that voice because it's not logical. It's not logical. There are probably some insanely talented, insanely skilled artists out there that get like no. Oh, oh you know what? I have an example of this. Um, uh, there's a concept artist I follow. Philip, I forget his last name, but um, he's like wildly talented paints stuff that to me looks like absolute masterpieces that should be on like a magic card like they're like actually like wildly skilled and sometimes he'll only get like 
a little he posts a lot about how he just doesn't get any engagement even though he's got hundreds of thousands of followers because we are all at the whim of the algorithm and it's not just about your skill in art it's about your skill in posting <laughs> and it sucks that in order to become a creator on the internet and and get your art seen by people you can't simply just be good at the thing that you're trying to get people to see you have to be a master of marketing you have to be an influencer you have there's so much stuff um and so i think you know like it's it's tough but you have to you have to separate valuing your art from from a number of likes on it and it's it's a, gonna take a lot of overcoming <laughs> overcoming the like the connection that you have there there's also that conundrum of where something with lots of effort doesn't get noticed as much as a smaller joke in it. Yep, exactly. Like memes will get more traction than a beautifully rendered finished piece of art. So, yeah. Even if we are good at marketing, algorithms still fuck you for reasons, surely. Yep, exactly. Eyes reaching critical dry. I have levels. flops all the time. Please administer eye drops. The algorithm is a cold, unfeeling beast. Yeah. And yes, uh, I think that is a great example. Find a a discord or a small group of friends and get responses from like posting in smaller communities than like Twitter. Cause Twitter is like shouting into the void or like Instagram. It's like, it takes a long time to build up community that way. And sometimes you have to start in another community first and meet people and build up that community. Um, yeah, following a small, find a smaller community to share it with where you can only care that these specific like 10 people could see it. Yep. Exactly. That is a big art servers are not great. Yeah, exactly. Like make sure that you are finding something of the appropriate size. Getting no engagement in a small community is really soul crushing. Don't always think of it as like um like cuz I mean we have we have tons of of people posting in the your creations and we don't always comment on them but you're still having people see it and you're inspiring other people like i always look and i at least put an emote reaction i don't always comment just because like i'll honestly i'm just busy <laughs> but i go through it like multiple times a week and i and i and i see people's growth like i literally had i talked about this earlier that like Vanderwolf's like, I didn't even know you saw that. Like, I was like, I've noticed improvement in your art. I've noticed it. Like, and, and he was like, I didn't even think you were looking at it. Like, you know, like, it's, it's, I, I am looking <laughs> and we all are looking at each other's art. Um, but it might be too big of a community here to like, really have like, uh, like individual responses. You might need to find something even smaller, something more intimate. Um, even just like, honestly, getting, value out of sharing with friends i get more dopamine hit out of sharing in my little goofballs group my art than sharing it on twitter <laughs> i really do i i get more more dopamine hit out of finding my little friend group and them giving me so much love on it than than out of you know a big hit on twitter and and i think the only way to overcome that is to like sort out relationship to social media like it runs deeper than that you know um, let me let me scroll back up and see if I missed any other questions here. Zeno said, how do you deal with imposter syndrome? We've kind of talked about that a little bit, but not quite in that particular way. Um, I think this chart is really it. <laughs> like, If you're feeling that imposter syndrome, you're probably in the it's Jover part of this cycle. The perceived lack of skill when your art skill is less than your ability to see skill when you can evaluate your art better than you can draw or whatever it is that you're doing, whatever you, when your ability to, to under to see good writing is better than your ability to write. When your ability to see good video editing is better than your ability to video edit that that's all going to res resort or result in like that Im imposter syndrome. When you have the feeling of like, you know, what's wrong with your work and that's why you're feeling like an imposter. Um, it's it. All you have to do is make enough art to up your skill, and eventually you'll pop back into one of these, because they keep going up. It goes past this chart, right? And then eventually your skill will overcome your ability to see it, 
Yeah, imposter syndrome is when you're in the it's Jover phase and then other and other people still like your work. Exactly. Like that's how you the reason you know it's a it's it's this and it's and it's like this phase is because of the fact that there is no skill level at which this stops being true. You don't hit a magical I'm finally good at art now. That will never happen or whatever it is you're doing. I know it's the balance between music skill and ability to hear music mistakes. Yes, yes, it's, it's exactly this. Like, this applies to any creative endeavor. Um, you, will, you will hear the mistakes. You'll create art. You'll create music. You'll, you'll write creative writing. You'll do whatever it is that you're working on. And you'll do something that's better than what you were doing before. And you'll, you'll hit this art high where you're like, this is the best thing I've ever made. I'm so proud of this. I'm so proud of this. And then one year later, you're going to look back at that thing that you were going, oh my God, I'm so proud of this and go, oh my God, that was awful. That means you've grown. That's a good thing. It will make you feel like crap, but it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. It means you have grown. It means that you are able to look at your art, your creation, whatever it is you're doing, and you have learned enough about it that you know you could do that better now or you like at least know what you would need to do to improve. Um, even though you aren't capable of physically doing it yet, you've recognized what you need to learn. Uh, we've had some really good conversations today. I think we could have lots of good talks. You know, it could be about like content creation. It could be about, uh, you know, I did that TikTok video, but maybe maybe streams where it's more interactive would be a good thing but i want i want galaxy brain to be an ongoing series like this first one was sponsored by skillshare but it's the galaxy brain thing is something i've been rolling around in my noggin for a while and it just happened to line up that this is a good time to launch it um but i want to do more educational streams like this if you guys liked it if you guys enjoyed it this whole stream was brought to you by skillshare um they were kind enough to reach out to me and i i went with this sponsorship because i I think you guys know I'm not the type to just take any sponsorship that'll come along. Um, I take stuff that I think is really relevant and helpful for my community. Uh, and I think that this Skillshare just came at a perfect time because literally I think it was like two days before they came up to me and asked. Uh, I had people in my chat saying, where are some online resources I can use to get better at art? And I think I even mentioned Skillshare at that point before I was even sponsored. So. Um, so this just kind of lined up and I appreciate you guys coming out for this very different type of stream format. Uh, and I hope we all learned a lot together today. I, I really like talking about this kind of stuff. I like talking shop. I may be a girl boss, but I don't like to gatekeep. Okay. I like to share information with people. I like, I, <laughs> I really love talking about this kind of stuff. What about gaslighting? Gaslighting isn't real. What are you talking about? Don't do that. <laughs>